Hello and welcome to the Town of Tewksbury's Department of Public Work Works Virtual IDDE Training. This annual training is mandatory for all town staff that performs inspections such as field work, facilities maintenance, or may deal with environmental issues. Uh, the training is part of the town's stormwater management program and is mandated by the EPA under the NIPTES MS4 permit. So here are the topics that will be covered in today's training. Uh, first, a little introduction about myself. Um, what is stormwater? Uh, the town of town's actual stormwater program uh, that's covered under our NIPTES MS4 permit. Uh, what is an illicit discharge? How to identify an illicit discharge? What to do if you suspect an illicit discharge? And then good housekeeping and best management practices at the town facilities and work sites. So the first is the introduction. So I'll just give you a, a little bit of background about myself. My name is Arthur Marcos. I work for the Department of Public Works Engineering Division. I've been here for about four years working for the town of Tewksbury. Uh, previously, I did work for a different community uh, for about uh, nine years where I um, dealt with stormwater issues and um, stormwater pollution investigations. Uh, uh, here in Tewksbury, I work on projects such as pavement management or sewer projects, but I also uh, work on our stormwater management program in our uh, EPA NIPTES MS4 permit compliance. Um, this IDE training is part of that uh, 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 and NIPTES MS4 compliance. Uh, so that's what um, we're uh, doing today. So first off, um, a little general uh, knowledge, give you a background. Um, what is stormwater? Uh, stormwater uh, is, is defined by the EPA um, as uh, runoff from rain, snow melt that drains into the town's drainage system and ultimately ends up in our groundwater, ponds, streams, and wetland resource areas. And why does stormwater matter? Um, and we can see with this uh, great diagram that we use um, a lot on, on a lot of our educational um, uh, um, materials, uh, it shows how uh, rain and snow melts uh, flows over pavement and it carries any pollutants such as oils, fertilizers, sand, trash uh, with it and eventually they enter our groundwater our ponds, our streams, wetland resource areas, and will contaminate drinking water supplies, fish, and wildlife habitat. Wildlife habitat. And as you know, uh, working for the town of Tewksbury, we do have a lot of wet areas in town. We have a lot of streams. We have a lot of we have uh, rivers, um, ponds, um, and wetlands that um, are, do, are affected by um, by stormwater. So. What is the NIPTES MS4 permit? Um, and you know, this NIPTES is, is a big acronym, and I think it's just just for to have general knowledge of what this acronym actually uh, st uh, stands for. So it's National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, and the MS4, which is uh, means M and four S's, so it's Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems. Now, this is an EPA-mandated program uh, that addresses water pollution. Uh, just for a background, this whole um, NIPTES MS4 permit stems from the Clean Water Act that was enacted in 1972. Um, it was started as a just just about drinking water and making sure that um, you know people of the United States or so citizens of the United States had clean wa clean drinking water, but now has slowly evolved and encompassed all waters of the USA, uh, including any lakes and ponds, streams, wetlands, and even groundwater. So what are the requirements under this permit? Um, what they do is they call it six minimum control measures. Um, so we do, there's uh, a lot of uh, activities that you might see us doing in town. Um, so uh, that um, we are doing public outreach and public education. You might see a lot of our messages on social media on the town's Facebook or Instagram account where we are putting out messages out there so people can be um, uh, aware of, of things that they, they can do to, to stop any stormwater pollution. Uh, we have public involvement and participation where we work with groups that, um, um, you know, maybe help us stencil catch basins or do uh, town cleanups. Uh, Listen, this charge of and elimination program is what we're talking about today, and that's what IDDE stands for. Um, and that is, uh, you know, in, in layman's terms, is just, you know, looking for pollution sources and eliminating them. Construction site stormwater runoff. 
runoff control. So this is a, um, uh, 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 and, and four and five are both um, um, municipal, um, uh, are, are governed by municipal bylaws that we have where, um, you know, construction sites uh, sh shall have, you know, silt sacks and catch, ba uh, catch basin, in their catch basins and also have uh, silt fences. So um, both of those are covered within our bylaws and our um, uh, regulations. Um, also, we have good housekeeping and pollution prevention. So for our permanently owned properties, such as um, DPW or DPW building or schools uh, or, or even our um, salt shed. So uh, basically with that number six is that we, we don't, uh, as much as we want to eliminate pollution, we don't want to create it uh, on our own job sites or our own buildings. Uh, just a little bit of background because of, um, uh, and, and a lot of people that do not work for a town or, or do not know the inner workings of the town's infrastructure, there's a lot of, always a lot of confusion about sanitary uh, sewer and storm drain systems. And uh, to someone else's credit, different towns for years or different cities uh, might have had different systems where they had combined systems. In town, we have a, sep a, a separate system. Uh, where we have, um, you know, sewer, which, uh, you know, flushing your toilet or uh, using your sink all goes into one system, goes through a series of pipes, manholes, and then ends up in low and is treated. Our sanitary system, I mean, our storm drain system, which we're talking about today, uh, does not get treated at all. And all these, all, all the, um, any water that's, that's carried into that system, whether it be through a catch basin or maybe someone's, uh, you know, uh, some pump foundation drain that all um, gets um, emptied out into uh, you know a waterway in town or a wetland or into groundwater. Um, so th that is that's untreated, and this is this is why uh, stormwater w with anything it carries will p does pose a threat to our environment. So uh, the first thing that that we did, and this was required under our permit, was um, to accurately. Um, map our drainage system, and we use our uh, GIS, uh, geographic information systems, to do this. Uh, we had um, consultants and in-house staff uh, put together our drainage system maps. Uh, and as you can see here, here's an, just kind of an example of, of how, it, how it works. We have our, you know, the yellow represents pipes, catch basins are, are the square and squares, and the triangles are the outfalls. So, um, so what happens is this is a, uh, uh, this shows here, this is actually near Long Pond, so you can see that if something enters one of these catch basins, you can kind of follow it and see where exactly all, you know, anything, you know, the clean water will, will go or even the pollution where that will go. So this is a key tool that we use um, and, and we need it to identify, be able to identify where, you know, we can trace back where this pollution is coming from uh, really easily. Um, and this is um, done all this, we have this, this uh, for the entire town. So we have that and we also have it on the GIS layer for those uh, staff that do have access to that. Um, so what we have also in town is what they call impaired waters in town. Uh, and then that's uh, a word saying that we have uh, rivers and streams that are uh, marked as uh, polluted by the EPA. Uh, not, so when we say they're impaired, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, that it, you know, they're so polluted that if you touch them, you can get sick. And what the EPA has defined as impaired water is it, it gives it a, a, a classification under a, a total maximum daily load. So what that means is that what is the total maximum daily load of a certain pollutant that the, that the stream or waterway can handle? Um, and then anything more than that will, will make it impaired. So this is a, um, it shows the, the ones that are impaired in red. And as you can see, there's some like Long Pond, uh, I think Ames Pond is up there, um, you know, and then, you know, Shashim and, and, um, and Merrimack. And you know, some of these are in town, but some of them also, obviously we, we work with these, uh, these rivers. We know that come, they come from other towns. So we're, you know, it's not only us that are, are creating these pollution, but we are um, responsible for not contributing to uh, more of it. So these are the type of impairments that we have in town. Um, so we have, um, you know, fecal coliform, um, and I'm going to go through these and just kind of give you a little brief um, uh, description of where they come from and, um, 
in how uh, in, 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 in what, where the the sources are. So fecal coliform uh, is 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 from sewer or septic tanks and, and pet waste. Um, obviously, uh, well. Obviously, people dumping um, pet waste or, or people have septic tanks in the leaching fields are, have failed, and that, wa that can seep into our groundwater and then hence uh, make their way into streams. Chloride is a uh, side product uh, from salting our roads. Uh, phosphorus is fertilizer and, um, in, from farming. Uh, people over, might over-fertilize their lawn, and it all gets washed out. Uh, mercury uh, it has made its way into you know, fish tissue. Uh, and that's originally from mining. Uh, but it, it seems it obviously spreads um, very quickly in, 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 in within our environment. Um, dissolved oxygen, that's one where it's not exactly um, in a pollutant itself, but it's an effect of, of having too many nutrients within the water, uh, creating algae blooms, and then those algae blooms um, take up all the, the, the oxygen in the water and they um, block out the naturally occurring plants. So it does create, can create fish kills, um, and, and um, it can, you know, it can create uh, inhospitable areas for, late, for native plants. PCB in fish tissue is another chemical waste. Um, e. coli, another one where it's with fecal coliform, it, it comes um, from sewer backups or from sewer overflows or septic tanks or another for pet waste. Sessi disc transparency is another de definition used by the EPA. That's when there's um, a lot of turbidity or the water is very cloudy and doesn't allow any, any sunlight in and, and it creates uh, an unhealthy uh, waterway. And then the last two are both um, um, invasive species, uh, the Eurasian water milfoil and Myriophyllum, which um, you know take over uh, and, and block out our native species. So, uh, just kind of a brief um, uh, description uh, of which ponds are, are impaired, which which waterways uh, are impaired with what types of impairments. Um, where you know we have the Shawshine River, which is you know has issues with fecal coliform or and mercury in in the fish. Um, you know the Merrimack has phosphorus, so there there may be some uh, some some runoff from some farming or from um, from lawn maintenance. Um, the Long Pond, which has come a long way, but still does have its impairments. Um, you know uh, excessive algae growth, phosphorus, uh, dissolved oxygen issues. Um, and you know, then chloride is in a lot, a lot of the, um, the tributaries, and that's probably from from salt, salt in all the roads. So these are our impaired waters uh, in, in in our water bodies, and what their impairments are in town. So our IDD program is obviously uh, we uh, is designed to um, avoid us uh, contributing to any more of these impairments in town. Uh, so what what our IDD program, which is illicit discharge detection and elimination. Um, it, it, we, have, so we have a full program that we under the DPW and under our stormwater permit that we uh, perform. So we, there's uh, a bunch of things that is required. And first was to establish a, by, uh, a bylaw so we can have legal authority to, um, to, to fine or, or enforce um, any dumping, which we do have. Um, stormwater mapping, which we've seen some of that mapping. So we, we have an in, in-house GIS coordinator that that uh, works on our, our, our GIS mapping, and not only that we have it uh, done once, we also update it yearly. Uh, we we have our inventory of our outfalls, so we um, have those so that we can perform outfall screening, meaning that we uh, we go and wait uh, when it's not raining and see if there's any water flowing out of our stormwater pipes. Uh, if there is, and then then we have to do an investigation. Catchment investigation, uh, which is is if we do find any. Um, wet weather, wet, we find any flow during dry weather periods. Um, we have our, you know, identify illicit sources, uh, the removal, you know, screening, so that's a whole process in case we do find an illicit discharge. And then, you know, our yearly annual, uh, which you're listening to today, which is our employee training. So let's get into exactly what we're uh, talking about and then so it's what is an illicit discharge and this is what we are um, asking you as uh, as as employees that are doing field inspections um, 
or are in the field or, do, or on work sites, uh, we're asking uh, you uh, to keep an eye out as you are the eyes and ears of the town since you are about uh, all about the um, around the town. So an illicit discharge is any discharge into our drainage system that is not composed entirely of stormwater. Um, but we're not, this is not, this, it's not a, um, an absolute thing. There's also exceptions, um, you know, and we have a list of exceptions that, the, that, that we, that, that the EPA uh, allows. And obviously water line flushing, firefighting activities, which is a big one, um, which obviously, you know, the, if, if there's a fire and, and water uh, gets into our uh, drainage system, um, that is allowable. Uh, uncontainment groundwater, um, you know, air conditioned condensation, irrigation uh, water, water from from pumps, uh, footing drain from cross crawl space pumps, footing drains, lawn watering, uh, car, individual resident car washing. Um, but we do suggest car washing be done in an area where it does not uh, flow into our system. Um, also, we do have a um, Assist, uh, you know, issue with dechlorinated swimming pools um, in town where people are, um, you know, in the fall time especially, are are um, emptying their swimming pools uh, out onto the street and they're flowing into our catch basins. And we we are reminding uh, res residents that to do that, it must be um, done during when the water has dissipated all the chlorine in it, um, not just um, just put it, just let it go when this when this water has uh, chlorine. So it usually takes two two to three weeks for the for all the chlorine to dissipate, and then we allow we will allow uh, swimming pools uh, to be discharged. And we are suggesting that they they do go on your lawn and let them infiltrate into the ground and not into the street or into a catch basin. So those are some of the things that is allowable uh, by um, our. Uh, by the by, the EPA as stormwater discharges. So the type of discharges that we are asking people to to look out for is, um, and these are you know these are things that we've seen in town or or, or we have to be aware of. So we have you know pet waste. Um, you know we see those a lot in catch basins where people throw it in waste where the baggies are. Motor oils uh, that can be dumped. You know antifreeze paints, cleaning products. You know excessive use of fertilizers, hazardous waste. Trash, uh, the chlorinated pool water, uh, you know, sediment maybe from construction sites, soaps, detergents, uh, sanitary sewer, which is also can be overflowed from um, manholes um, or or illicit discharges. Um, so places where we actually find our illicit discharges. Um, Roadways uh, is one major one where you know you'll see obviously drainage in the road and you'll see you know maybe someone dump something in the roadway. Uh, people's driveways, catch basins themselves, in wetlands, in rivers and streams, you might see uh, you might see evidence of illicit discharges uh, at industrial sites, uh, places where people store uh, uh, materials you know such as sand or stone or salt uh, on construction sites. Um, which which need attention because they can uh, uh, become a, a source of uh, illicit discharges. And then gas stations, vehicle repair, which obviously deal with a lot of uh, liquids of um, in, in gas um, spills. So what is an indicator of an illicit discharge? Um, so here's a bunch of examples. So we have foam, which is an indicator of uh, maybe an indicator of, of, of somebody washing uh, uh, their vehicle, or or say or maybe a washing machine um, is discharging into a, a stream or a pond. We have oil sheen that can result um, uh, be a result of a leak or a spill. Um, cloudiness in the water. Is, so it might, if it's water is very cloudy, in this case there might be some dust or ash in the water. Um, you know, color and odor always is in the indicator. If there's a chemical spill or there's um, a water, um, if there's if there's something in the water that's causing a, a smell, you might smell it, or it might just be in 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 uh, in, in the catch basin itself. Uh, excessive sediment, um, 
which which is a lot of disturbed earth, a lot of, you know, might be a lot of sand particles within the water. Uh, then you have you know sanitary waste and optical with optical enhancers. So that what that means is that within sanitary waste in in, in most homes, uh, your washing machines are hooked up to your sewer system, um, and then that the, those detergents have a special shimmer to them. They give that shiny effect. So that's something that that can indicate um, that that it's coming from a um, from illicit illicit connection, which is defined as someone's sewer hooked up into the storm drain system. Uh, and then orange staining, which um, we we, we uh, can can be an indicator of high con uh, concentration of high minerals, but also it, it also is an indicator that it could be a natural um, a natural uh, presence um, due some to 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 bacteria, um, and then that's what comes brings us to our second. Um, uh, slide on this topic, which is you know what is a, what we call false indicators. Now, um, now just make it clear that if you do see something and you might be able to rule it out by by, bunch of, by these tips that I'm going to give you, we also will still need, want to still be notified. Not only do we want to go out and rule it out ourselves, we want to be, be aware of it because in case we get another call and we want to make sure that we that we have actually um, uh, uh, looked at it and made sure that it it. Um, it was an actually a false indication. So there's you know things like natural foam, uh, which is typically present uh, pers uh, per uh, persistent light, not slimy to the touch. So it's a little bit of different texture for natural foam than than say foam that's coming out of a washing machine or washing your car. And that's and that's uh, caused by a lot of um, decomposing um, uh, um, natural material. Sometimes if there's a, a dead animal, the an the fats actually um, create a natural foam. Um, and then, you know, there's sewage smell sometimes. You, you might smell that, but it might be just, you know, it may be in a wetland or a bog area where um, decomposing plants and the organic matter in the water it, it smells like sewage. You know, natural gas leaks that sometimes can smell like it's sewage, uh, especially when they have a lot of sulfur smell into them. Um, that orange rust color, which I do have a picture of, also uh, can indicate high iron content. And what is is what, how that works is that, and nothing wrong with a high iron contact. That's something naturally occurring. But uh, there's, there's certain bacteria that that eat the iron and then oxidize that iron and and they basically turn it into rust. So what you see in is iron, an iron eating bacteria there. So that's natural. We do see those uh, in town. Um, and then we have you know that an oil sheen, which sometimes can um, can be produced by bacteria, natural bacteria, uh, and it creates a natural oil sheen. Uh, and then algae blooms. Uh, algae blooms are not themselves uh, the, pro the problems, but they become they are the indicator that that there may be uh, an accumulation of nutrients uh, such as phosphorus, ammonia, nitrogen, maybe and it's, you know some fertilizers that are getting there. So the, the algae blooms become an indicator um, that there's that there could be a um, a, another issue there. So again, those ones, those are what we call false indicators. But again, we like to know about them. Um, you know, and um, and once you see it, sometimes you do see some, you know, a stream with, you know, that's orange or something that's it is alarming. But um, we again, please notify us so that we can go and eliminate any other possibilities. So what I do have here is a bunch of pictures um, of different um, types of pollution uh, or illicit discharges that we do see around town. Some of them are are filmed. Uh, some of them were taken in town. Some of them are not. But I just to go through them because they are the most typical ones that that you may see uh, at, during um, during your travels or during um, during inspections. So one of the biggest ones is pet waste. Uh, people tend to like to pick up after the dogs, but not necessarily pick up put the put the waste where it should go. And making clear, it should go in the trash. Um, people do tend to throw these into the catch basins. People tend to throw these um, into the woods with the bags, um, and then you know we we do run into these when we do our catch basin cleaning, and um, we, as we do find them, we'll go and fly the whole, whole entire neighborhood, let them know that you know that pet waste should go in the trash and not uh, you know in the woods or in the in in, in, in the, into a catch basin. Oil sheen and water. So there's just a picture of it. Um, this one I think was a natural oil sheen, but here's a picture of that sheen on that water showing it. Um, and that's something that if you do see that, we'd like to be notified. Um, dumping. People might just be dumping uh, chemicals from their, uh, you know, their garage or their, their workshop or right into the catch basin and they think nothing of it. Um, and then you would like to find out who did it, inform them, and you know, we might have to uh, clean and remove that. 
So, uh, you know, and sometimes you do see evidence of staining on the catch basin grate itself. Um, but, um, yeah, so if you do see someone doing that, you make sure you let us know. Um, here's another one where actually in the one was in town where a uh, resident seems uh, to like to just clean their um, wheelbarrow right on the um, on top of the uh, catch basin and clean it right in there. And obviously you can see the dirt around it. So we don't know what was in there, but we did find out who it was and made sure that uh, it does not happen again. Um, and then we did clean out those catch basins. So again, if you do see something like this, we we we'd like to be notified. Uh, another one is dumpster runoff. Obviously, most businesses are required by law to have a dumpster. Um, the the problem is is that they need to be covered because when it does rain, um, they will fill with water and then leach out the weep holes in the bottom, and all that uh, be, all that leachate that comes out is is highly polluted with anything that was in that dumpster. And then you know this one is next to a catch basin, but uh, and sometimes the next streams, they're all be, they're mostly on the edges of property, so they do tend to leach right into um, our wetlands and or or anything that's around there. So it defies the purpose of having a dumpster if if you just if all this all that uh, chemical waste or let's say chemical waste, all that potential pollution uh, is going to be going into our um, drainage system in our in our wetlands. So that's something we we try to let people know. Um, that they must be covered at all times, especially for for um, businesses. Here's a picture of that orange um, discoloration in the waterways, uh, and not only orange. When we 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 you might you might get a call, might maybe it's green or or dark red or light or dark brown. Um, so I mean, this one obviously um, is most likely um, the cause of the of the iron eating bacteria. But um, it could indicate other things. Um, so we again, we'd like to still know where those are. Um, um, and, and you know anything that looks odd or any discoloration in water. Suds and streams. This one's actually uh, in town. We actually uh, we went and investigated this. This was called in by a uh, citizen, and it does look when you drive by it. And this is actually uh, uh, near Level Lane off of Shawshank Street. And as you can see, um, it, you know these uh, these you know have a amount of suds that are, that are piling up at, at the end of of the little rapids area. And what we did, we went out and tested them, and we found that there was no um, detergents or soaps present. Um, but the stream was coming from an area, uh, a little bog area, like a wetland little area, where it's, it was highly organic material. And um, as that breaks down, it carries out oils, and and um, and that mat, and that as it as it goes over a um, an area of the stream where it, it, where it hits a little bit of rapids. Um, it actually creates that foam, so that's what we 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 determined it was. Um, and do like I said, so we do have a record of this, so we do forget phone calls. Uh, we know right away what it is. So, but again, that's the type of stuff we would like to go and and um, and investigate. If you do see uh, suds suds in a stream or a wetland, um, trash and debris. Trash, trash and debris is one where it's not necessarily a point source, but obviously it's aesthetically not pleasing. But it may also indicate that if people are dumping, uh, if, if there's accumulation of, of dumping of plastics and, and, and debris there, there could be other, other um, uh, things, other pollutants being dumped at the same time. So it's, it's nice to, uh, to be notified of any, if there's, if there's a, a huge amount of debris and trash uh, in, in, in our uh, streams and streams and ponds. And now, and now those, now some uh, trash like that, float, what we call floatables, gets into the Merrimack or or, or the Shawshank River. Those slowly uh, will make their way um, to the ocean. Um, so not only do they pollute um, what are in town, they will slowly make their way out of town and maybe hit the next town or, or make it to the to the mouth of the river and to the ocean. So it's something that we are aware of and we try to to um, identify. Uh, we, if we can. Uh, f f vehicle fluid leaks, and that's one where people um, you know, might have an issue with their vehicle, and you know, obviously they, if they can't fix it in time, they leak into the street, um, and then it comes some rain, and then it goes um, into our drainage system. Um, and here's one where you know someone try to uh, uh, mitigate the issue using some hay or a tray, but it, it quite didn't work because that person did not park at the same place every time. So. 
Um, you know, we did. We informed that this has actually happened in town. We informed them, and then you know they fixed their car and and, and whatnot. But you know, we um, we did see an, an ongoing issue, and we don't know how long it was going on for. But um, we didn't notify the resident, and, and he took care of the issue. Uh, sediment, uh, and this is a actually uh, issue in town where they actually um, we went got a call where. Uh, a homeowner was regrading his lawn during the rainstorm, and all the sediment uh, was carried down the street and into our catch basins. So we went there, informed him, stopped. Um, luckily, we were cleaning those catch basins um, in the upcoming weeks. So we were able to remove all that sediment, um, and, and that resident was told and notified, and he ended up putting up some um, hay bales um, to stop any any uh, more runoff uh, into the roadway. So our um, Another one that we get a lot of calls on are the um, uh, uh, hoses that are uh, that, that, that directly tied into our catch basins, um, and obviously we don't know what those hoses are. Um, so it could be anything, but in most cases, it's someone uh, draining their pool or draining their basement through a sump pump. So we we get calls on those when we go out there. We we let the residents know not to do that. Um, it, people we suggest them to to let it go onto their lawn and let it dissipate into the ground naturally instead of dumping it into the catch basin. Um, and so this is we do quite get a lot of these calls. Uh, mostly a lot of times in the fall time or in the springtime when people are um, you know when it's been heavy rains or people uh, in the fall time when people are uh, dumping their their pools. Um, another one, uh, which is not a you know something visual, but it's more of a smell. So if you do if things that we like to know about, you know like uh, strong strong smells of sewage, uh, petroleum, gas, uh, those type of smells, sulfide, um, and any chemical or odd smells that you smell uh, coming uh, maybe even at a catch basin or like from a wetland area or from a stream. So those are things that we. Uh, we like to be made aware of uh, not only if you do see some discoloration in the stream or, or you see someone dumping something, uh, which is more of a visual thing. So again, as as a lot of the, a lot of the people that are uh, listening here are watching, are out in the streets doing inspections. They uh, you might smell some some something like say sewage uh, where in, near wetlands or something. Uh, we please notify us. So. This takes us to our first video, um, and this video uh, is reiterating a lot of the uh, points that I just touched, uh, and it puts a, um, a visual on, um, on a lot of the things that we, we just talked about. So here's the video. Quiz question. What is one of the most cost-efficient practices for finding and stopping water pollution? Here are several hints. Number one. This practice has been largely overlooked in the past by local governments. Number two, it can help meet permit and regulatory requirements. And three, it can improve stream health by achieving significant reductions in pollutants. The answer, IDDE, Illicit Discharge Detection and Elimination. So what exactly is IDDE? If you walk alongside almost any stream in an urban or suburban area, you will see the openings of many pipes leading directly into the stream. These pipes carry runoff from a multitude of land uses, such as streets, parking lots, and rooftops. This stormwater runoff enters the stream only during or after a rainstorm. However, some of these pipes carry flow to the streams at times other than rainstorms. Unnoticed and undetected, some of these pipes carry sewage, detergents, bacteria-laden water, and even toxic chemicals quietly polluting our streams, rivers, and lakes. These flows are known as illicit discharges, and IDDE is in the process of finding and fixing these hidden culprits. It's like being a stream detective. Recent analysis conducted by the Center for Watershed Protection for one local government attributed nearly 100% of nutrient pollution in the local watershed to outfalls with potential illicit discharge problems. Samples exceeded certain indicator thresholds, which means they're much more likely to contribute unacceptable levels of potentially harmful bacteria and pathogens. So how do we go about finding and fixing these hidden stream culprits? It begins with walking local waterways and looking for pipes coming out of the banks. This is important because you may find pipes that are not on existing maps or have gone undetected. 
This is done during a dry period so that all flowing outfalls can be detected. Once at the outfall, conduct a quick assessment to determine if an illicit discharge may be present. Look for algae or benthic growth on the bottom of the pipe, perhaps sewage fungus, poor pool quality, corrosion of the pipe, odor, the presence of floatables, or discoloration of the water. Since illicit discharges may be hard to detect, a series of water quality tests should be performed to determine the source of the water and get quantitative discharge measurements. Ammonia is the primary indicator of the presence of an illicit discharge. High levels likely indicate a wastewater or sewage discharge, and while some analyses can be done in the field, tests for potassium, fluoride, nitrogen, phosphorus, or bacteria are best conducted back at the lab. If detected and confirmed, a storm drainage area investigation is conducted to determine the source of the problem. This involves moving up the pipe or up the drainage system and testing the water at outfalls or manholes along the way until the source is isolated. So how do we eliminate these culprits? Because many sources of pollution are hidden from everyday view, eliminating illicit discharges involves working with businesses, homeowners, local governments, utility departments, and watershed groups to restore and protect clean waterways. It can involve redirecting pipes and drains to the sanitary sewer, plugging floor drains, fixing sewer line leaks, and other practices. It is also important to quantify and accurately report on the problems fixed and the pollutants eliminated. This shows that these efforts are effective and feasible to implement. It gives the local program due credit for permit and compliance programs and communicates that water quality is being improved. To learn more about IDDE and other strategies we can use to protect and promote clean water, follow the links on the right side of the Center for Watershed Protection website and join our mailing list to be notified about future educational webcasts. Share this with your friends and colleagues on Facebook. And make sure to look for upcoming webcasts on ways you can help protect our streams and waterways. So what we have, we'll continue on and we have some a little more specific information um, that refers to a lot of our, our um, employees that, that uh, that have work sites, uh, so we have you know a water department who do water work, or we might have you know facilities doing doing a project um, uh, on one of their on one of their buildings, or um, you know just you know fixing a pothole and stuff like that. So there's all this stuff that that we uh, these are all what we call best management practices, and these are the, these are what we have our um, contractors abide by. So as 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 work crews for the town, we we abide by the same things, and a lot of these are, we do them anyways. We're just kind of a reminder, but there's a lot of um, you know just a lot of tips um, and common sense stuff that we do, and we just uh, like to keep doing it. So like you know, do not store materials near a storm drain or a catch basin or stream. Um, you know, do, do have your stockpiles always protected. Um, you know, by tarp or plastic sheeting. Um, you know, schedule excavation um, and grading, not, you know, for dry weather, not when we're expecting rain. Um, you know, never pump directly into the town's graded catch basin. You know, you should, that should let that run over um, ground first or have it, um, you know, go into a little, um, a little dammed area where, you know, the sediment can stay before all the water uh, carries it into our, into our drainage system. So these are a lot of tips that we, that we, um, we we want our private contractors to do on site, and we we inspect. So we also want um, uh, us as a um, uh, as as a town to to also abide by. Um, the other is good housekeeping and facilities best management practices. So obviously the town um, it, it has a lot of facilities, schools. We have our public works. We have town hall. We have a lot of our our, our facilities, um, our parks. As, as their facilities, so um, you know, obviously for this for this uh, training, you know, we are looking out for illicit discharges. So as much as we want to prevent them, we don't want to um, create them as well. So um, so this is this is what the EPA also wants to make sure that we are abiding by the same best management practices that you know pri the private sector is. So. You know, there's a bunch of tips here, and for the most part, we do well. So, you know, there's you know things that are very intuitive again, 
like keep all work areas neat and organized, um, you know, sweep up trash and debris as needed so, you know, that they won't, it, we have a nice organized site so someone won't walk through and, and trip over and hit a barrel and, and, and cause some, uh, cause a uh, uh, oil, uh, cause, cause a spill. Um, you know, we recycle and dispose of all waste properly, um, you know, um, there's other, other ones where it's like, you know, uh, use dry cleanup methods um, to clean up spills, you know, and, and, and not, not wash it out with water. Um, you know, and they, a lot of the stuff is, um, you know, we obviously have, um, you know, places like the salt shed uh, in town where, you know, you don't want it, you want it uh, exposed to rain because that's going to wash it out directly and, and, and that's, you know, high concentration of salt. So, um, so there's a lot of um, a lot of tips here that we have, um, but also what, what we have now also is a, a video that we're going to show, which again reiterates a lot of these best management practices and shows some real life examples um, on different types of um, like construction sites, but also you know, within our facilities. So here's the video. During concrete saw cutting operations, be sure to vacuum or contain slurry. Create a pool of slurry by blocking the flow along a curb using sandbags or other material. Once contained, vacuuming the slurry with a wet dry vacuum is the preferred collection method. The slurry may then be poured into an open container and disposed of in the trash after the water has evaporated. Do not allow the slurry to enter the storm drains or to remain on pavement to dry out. Require concrete trucks to wash out in a designated location where wash water will be contained and will not drain into a storm sewer, drainage ditch, or creek. Place stockpiles of asphalt patching material on concrete or other paved surfaces and cover them to prevent contact with rain. Mix only the amount of patching material necessary to complete the repair. Sweep up and properly dispose of all patching material that is not compacted or left over from the repair. Use less harmful products rather than diesel for asphalt patching and cleanup activities. Clean trucks, equipment, and tools in designated equipment wash facilities where wash water will be contained. If no wash facility is available, Clean equipment over a layer of absorbent material spread on a paved surface or heavy plastic sheeting. Sweep up the absorbent and dispose of in accordance with state and federal regulations. Make certain that hopper drain plugs are always sealed during collection. Check vehicles frequently for leaking fluids and notify a supervisor of significant leaks. Immediately clean up spills to minimize safety hazards and prevent spreading. Contain spills and leaks using absorbents and take steps to stop the leak if possible. Once the spill is contained, promptly dispose of the absorbents following state and federal regulations. Wash collection trucks only in facilities where wash water drains into the sanitary sewer or is collected and recycled. Do not allow wash water to enter the storm drain system. You should store materials away from high traffic areas to prevent accidents that might cause spills. Steps should be taken to prevent stockpiles of materials such as soil, road salt, and asphalt patching materials from being washed into a storm drain. Use containment walls to separate different materials. Placing a tarp over these stockpiles will also help prevent erosion. Even effective erosion control will not keep all fine sediments out of stormwater. No matter the size of the project, measures should be taken to control sediment and prevent it from entering the storm drain system. An organic filter berm is a natural way to prevent sediment runoff. 
It is a one to three foot high broom of mulch and compost placed around a disturbed area. A silt fence is a filter fabric trenched into the soil and attached to supporting posts. The filter fabric must be buried at least six inches into the soil or else the water may flow right under the fabric. A triangular sediment dike is a welded wire mesh shaped into a triangle that is covered with filter fabric. All of these methods use the same principle. They prevent silt runoff by slowly releasing the water after the sediment falls out. Additional sediment control can be achieved by placing wire reinforced filter fabric directly in front of the storm drain inlets. This method must always be used in conjunction with other on-site methods. Otherwise, there will be too much sediment in the water and the storm drain will clog. By using these best management practices, you will be helping keep our community and waterways clean and healthy for future generations to enjoy. Okay, so that was the um, video, and that brings us uh, towards our end here um, of our training. Um, so the last and uh, well, I'd say critical part is um, what do you do when you, rep to, when you, you see an illicit discharge um, in town? Um, so what we're asking everyone to do is probably the easiest way is, is to call the Department of Public Works. Uh, obviously, we have hours 8.30, 4.30, Monday to Friday, but as all, always leave a message um, if so, if no, if no one is uh, – uh, here, then we can we can uh, get it right away uh, when we come back to work. Um, if you are an employer in town, you can you also can just report it um, directly um, to me, and I have my information after after uh, in the next slide. And then, and then on the right here is is our um, is our lab that we have at the DPW. So uh, with that lab, we have capabilities of going out to test for certain uh, pollutants. Um, so uh, we can eliminate or, or identify illicit discharges uh, rather quickly in town. So that's again, so if you do report an illicit discharge or suspect illicit discharge and we do get the message, we'll, we'll be out there as soon as possible. Um, so, so, you know, any questions? We are uh, I'm taking questions uh, via email. You can just email me, here's my email, or give us a call. Um, Give me a call and I can answer your questions. Um, or, or if you'd like, um, I said you can report also a list of discharge and we can uh, go out and take a look at it. And then we do have a great resource, which is um, the town's stormwater um, website, um, which is um, uh, has a lot of uh, tips for homeowners, a lot of tips for, for construction sites, uh, business owners, uh, and a lot of pictures of a lot of the stuff that we do around town. Uh, also has a lot of documents that you can use that you can um, and links uh, for different resources on the internet. Um, so again, we have our own URL. So it's uh, the What Towns website, www.tewksbury-ma.gov backslash stormwater. So again, so that does it for our annual training. Um, uh, like I said, this is for um, our eyes and ears uh, of the town, a lot of our uh, inspectors or um, workers who work around town um, or those who deal with a lot of environmental issues. So we hope that, you know, if you do identify or see any, any stormwater pollution or, um, in town that you, um, you do notify us. And again, so thank you for your time. Um, and I, we hope you, uh, you learned something. And uh, again, we appreciate your, uh, your uh, input if you do find any um, uh, IDDE incidences uh, during your travels around town. Okay, and thank you.